<clears throat> Hello, I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a board certified anesthesiologist, integrative medicine specialist, and I'm also the medical director of a ketamine infusion clinic where I help patients overcome some of the most challenging mental and physical health conditions. Today, <laughs> today by popular demand from so many emails I've received, I'm going to talk about the vagus nerve <clears throat> and our breathing because our minds and bodies are connected in ways that when we can affect our mind, we can affect our body and vice versa for bad things and for good things, just like how PTSD can affect our bodies through all the hyperarousal, hypersympathetic stimulation, our minds in positive ways can also affect positive changes in our body. Our body can also affect our mind. Nowhere is that more clear than with our breathing and there's very few part, very few things in our bodies that we can control with our minds that if, and if we don't think about it with our minds, they'll still happen. Breathing is one of them because when we're sleeping, we're still breathing. There's another one that I'm going to throw out there. I want other people to, <laughs> I want you guys to guess here in the uh, chat. I'll give you a massive shout out. If you know the other major um, bodily function that will happen, whether or not you think about it, uh, but if no one guesses, I'll, I'll mention it for sure. I see people streaming in, by the way. Paul, good to see you. Heidi, it's always good to see you. Uh, breathing, though, is, is different than the other one. But do please guess the other one. I really want to see who knows it because it's we don't really think about it, but our bodies are always doing it, uh, but we can control it as well. Breathing is very special because of what's uh, the, the 10th cranial nerve. It's called the vagus nerve. It's a direct highway from our brains to our hearts. And we, man <clears throat> we manipulate it under anesthesia all the time, whether you're connected to the ventilator or through the medications that we give, propofol, ketamine, glycopyrrolate, neostigmine. We're constantly changing vagal nerve. And there are some people that are walking around without a vagal nerve connection from their brain to their heart. And that's where breathe breathing mediates how the vagus nerve communicates in the brain to the rest of our body. To be clear, we can control that with our breathing, even though I was taught in medical school at Stanford that it wasn't, it, it wasn't emphasized. Nothing against Stanford. I love Stanford, but it wasn't something that was taught. There wasn't something that I really appreciated in residency. It wasn't until my fellowship later on that I realized, wow, I can help patients in the most scary moments of their lives before the mask goes on, modulate their 10th cranial nerve. Um, so, the question is, who's walking around without a vagus nerve from their brain to their heart? I'll give you a shout out for that as well. So as the comments are coming in, uh, Michaela, good to see you. Teresa, good to see you. Uh, Tony, everyone. Uh, digestion. Okay, so I was asking, what is the other main bodily function that happens, uh, whether or not we think about it? Digestion, we can control to a certain extent with our, our mind, because when we get stressed out, when we're in pain, our gut motility slows down, uh, usually above the colon and speeds up below the colon. But the other one that I'm thinking of here is blinking because you can control when you blink, right? But even if you're not thinking about it, your eyes still blink. Pretty cool. Blinking and breathing. But you're right that digestion is also something that we can control, but will also happen even if we're not thinking about it. Does the vagus nerve control heart rate? Oh, so solo. Yes, it does. It's what we're talking about right now. And Christy, very good to see you. Darian, always good to see you. Tony Ann Zimmerman is not like the mask. And yo, know, I agree. It smells like, I always describe it if it's a pediatric patient as uh, <laughs> dinosaur farts or beach ball flavor. If it's an adult, it's just like a plastic mask. But hey, if you don't like the mask, which is very common for many of my patients, I always ask them to hold it themselves. It gives everyone a sense of control, so I'm not mashing on it really hard on their face. It's just not comfortable to have it, have someone else pushing on you, on your face, on your nose, gets in your eyes. It's just like, dude, I always let the patient, I encourage the patient to hold it themselves with their, actually with their hand with the IV. But anyways, <laughs> back to the vagus nerve, because this is what I want everyone here to take away, because it's so powerful. Our breathing modulates that vagus nerve. It's not only how we breathe though, and we'll talk about that, how many seconds in, how many seconds out, but it's also medicines, what I believe one of the top three secrets, and that's mindful breathing. And I've got to say 50% of my patients blow me off when I bring it up. 
And I respect that. If somebody is thinking about other stuff, like what kind of breathing tube they're going to get, the pain after surgery, I understand they're thinking of other things. But I really encourage my patients before the anxiety of surgery kicks in, or if it's postoperatively, or if they're coming from a ketamine infusion clinic, for them to recognize how much power mindfulness has not only over the vagal nerve, but more importantly, over us recognizing the habit loops that are probably responsible for most of the pathology, that is to say disease, that patients come to me in the operating room with or for academic infusion for. Back to some comments here. Uh, Teresa says, I have gastroparesis, likely POTS. I think my vagus nerve is messed up. Teresa, I'm so sorry that you are suffering from those. Those are no joke. Gastroparesis in particular before surgery is a big deal. And I talked about it on many other videos before because we have to do anesthesia differently when somebody has gastroparesis. It's no joke. Uh, and POTS as well, we have to modify anesthesia because there is this complete dysregulation of various nerves, including the vagus nerve. Uh, Danielle, good to see you. Michaela, when I had a workup for POTS, uh, with a specialist at Cleveland Clinic. They did a different vasovagal, or they did various vasovagal maneuvers, and I was in a ton of monitors to rule out vagus nerve dysfunction. Exactly. And that, that's right. It's what we do. Anesthesia is a perfect, you're on the monitors, it's a perfect vagus nerve test because when we give you propofol, for example, or an anesthesia gas, if you have vagal nerve dysfunction, it's uh, apparent and it can cause problems, which is why we have so many medications, like I said, epinephrine, glycopyrrolate, et cetera, to help uh, counter those effects. By the way, one comes from plants. It's called atropine. comes from the belladonna plant, one of the first medications we've ever discovered <laughs> uh, in, in the world here. And very powerful effects to counter hyperactive vagal tone. We use it in the operating room and the emergency room all the time. Also, solo, in my physiology lab, we pinch the vagus nerve of a frog and its respiratory system <laughs> suppressed. Yeah. Um, so the vagus nerve and the diaphragm, great question, Oso Solo. The most powerful effects of the vagus nerve come from its brain, its connection from the brain to the heart, and we still got to finish talking about that. The diaphragm is interesting because how we choose to breathe does affect the vagal nerve and vagal tone of the heart, meaning how much the heart is slowing down and our body is entering a relaxive state to improve gastric motility, to improve not only mood, but also we believe anti-inflammatory effects, et cetera. So when we control our diaphragm, we influence our vagal tone to answer your question. So the way that I always encourage my patients to breathe uh, when they have the oxygen mask on, or even when they don't at home, is to focus on lengthening exhalation, which means breathe in as fast or slow as you want, but slow down on exhaling because it does a couple things to your body. For example, imagine you're breathing through a spoon or a spoon, <laughs> a uh, straw. I, you've seen me with the syringe. I don't have it with me today, but when I breathe through the syringe and I've demonstrated the modified Valsalva maneuver that's very effective for breaking supraventricular tachycardias, you're slowing your exhalation. You're increasing intrathoracic pressure. These all kick in reflexes in your body to slow your heart rate down. It's why it breaks the tachycardia. It can also help have calming effects, but you don't need a straw or this is an LMA, but whatever, you know, you don't need to have a straw or a syringe. You can focus on it yourself. What I recommend patients to do is to bring their tongue up to the top of their palate, their, their top of their mouth. I'll show you. I brushed my teeth earlier, but I did have something after. So I don't hope I, have, hope I don't have any <laughs> food in my mouth, but, uh, See what I'm doing with my tongue? I'm bringing it to the top like that. So when I exhale, it literally is slowing my, my breath coming out of my, my mouth because my tongue is at the top. It's at the roof, roof of my mouth. When you slow down the exhalation, either with your tongue at the top of your mouth, just by slowing down how fast you can breathe out or with a syringe like for the modified Valsalva, or through a straw or whatever, you're increasing the pressure in your thorax as you're exhaling out against that force. By the way, we do this under anesthesia all the time in patients for other reasons, but that helps 
increase the vagal tone to your heart. It'll slow down your heart rate. When I've connected myself to monitors in the operating room, you see my pulse ox, my EKG change dramatically based on how I'm breathing. It's a combination of the numbers of five seconds in, five seconds out, or four, seven, eight. But more importantly, it's because of the mindfulness of us paying attention. The point that is the plus point here, which is maybe even more important than all of this, is that if we get in the habit of being mindful of our breathing, that is the window into self-healing because mindfulness, as corny and cheesy as everyone you know, thinks it is, is really the cornerstone of learning how to tap into our new healing potential, not only through the vagus nerve, which by the way is very powerful. You know, we place vagal nerve uh, stimulators for people, for patients with epilepsy. Uh, it's been shown in sepsis to possibly have positive effects, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. So clearly there's a beneficial physiologic role. I do it in the operating room all the time, right? But even outside the operating room, when we are tuned in with our breathing so that it is a window into us being mindful about our body, what are we thinking of? What habit loops are we falling into? Are we angry, frustrated, sad, depressed, anxious? Is our heart rate going up? You know, are we sweaty palms? All of these hyper arousal symptoms that come up in my patients with PTSD, with anxiety or a panic disorder, <clears throat> or having a flat out at the beginnings of a panic attack when they might still be able to rail, uh, rein things in. That mindfulness, there is no substitute, no medication that I can give with the exception of psychedelics to help make this facilitated for future events. No medication we can give in the moment that can help be a substitute for mindfulness of what our body is going through so that we can get in control of the driver's seat. I've talked the last couple of weeks about the three C's over and over again. When we're mindful, we are in control, C number one. We are curious about what our body's going through. It's like, wow, I sense my heart rate going up. I feel tightness in my chest. Oh, I feel sweaty in my palms. I feel like I'm breathing in a rapid, shallow way. We know rapid, shallow breathing increases sympathetic tone. It's actually, it's it been known for thousands of years. Let's look in India where people will purposely breathe through their nose, rapid, shallow to rev up their bodies. Ask athletes to do this, et cetera. But you're engaging curiosity about what's going on in your body. <clears throat> the first, this is very important to begin to break habit loops. And certainty, so that's the third C, certainty, right? When we're uncertain, we let anxiety flourish. When we're certain, we can help get back in control, right? Certainty in the sense that when I'm mindful of how I'm breathing, I know how my body's going to respond to my four, seven, eight breath, my five and five out, with the exception of those rare people, which by the way, nobody ever commented on, uh, Who's walking around with a vegadini like Chris D is saying? There's very few people that this, they don't have the same certainty here. They're walking around without a vagus nerve from their brain to their heart. Those are people who've had heart transplants because we cut the vagus nerve. Someone who's had a vagadini like Chris is saying, maybe in the past they used to do this for severe acid reflux or peptic ulcer disease before we had proton pump inhibitors and H2 antagonists like Pepsid. They had to actually cut the vagus nerve so it would prevent the over secretion of acid. If you've had your vagus nerve cut, this won't apply to you because you don't have that same control over your body. We can talk about the physiology. We need to do anesthesia very, very differently in patients who have had a vagotomy, by the way. Um, and then the third category of patients who don't have that vagal nerve uh, direct connection is if you're taking beta blockers because that's fundamentally altering how the acetylcholine is interacting with the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors on your myocardium. I don't want to get overly technical, but I know some people appreciate uh, the jargon there. <laughs> so if you don't fall in those categories, which is like 97% of my patients or 95%, <clears throat> then you can have certainty that when you are being mindful of your breathing, mindful of your body, what's going on in it, uh, you have certainty in how it's going to respond based on how you affect change, how you breathe. The thoughts that you let enter your brain, the thoughts that you act on, and, and this goes on and on. But that's why breathing, and we it's the easiest thing for us to begin to be in touch with on a frequent basis. Not only when we're in times of dire stress and anxiety, when we're rapid, shallow breathing, but even when we're just chilling in autopilot. 
So we have got a lot of comments to catch up on. Let's see. <clears throat> um, Tony Ann Zimmerman has surgery tomorrow morning. And all this preoperative stuff is worse for me than the surgery itself. Well, I want everyone here to send Tony Ann some positive vibes because going through surgery ain't difficult. Tony Ann, if you're comfortable, um, let us know what kind of surgery you're having so that I can better, um, better help allay some of those anxieties and fears. There's lots of videos that I have on what you can do to prepare yourself for surgery. There's so many uh, on the channel. Uh, I really wish you the best of luck and I hope everyone here sends you positive vibes. Um, Teresa Lynn, breathing through a spoon would be something. Yes, you're right, it would be. <laughs> How do you know when your vagus nerve is damaged? Heidi, the most common things that we see when the vagus, when someone has a vagotomy is that there is no relationship between breathing and heart rate. Heart rate variability goes down the toilet and your resting heart rate goes up about 20, 25 beats per minute. Everyone's a little bit different, but because you have no vagal tone to slow your heart rate down, their resting heart rate comes up. So patients with heart transplants are living in 90, 100 beats per minute all the time. And if they're trying to run a mile or something, their heart rate won't be able to adjust to the activity nearly as fast because other nerves have been cut. The sympathetic nerve fibers have also been cut that are the direct lanes from the brain to the heart. So that's why we need to give pharmaceutical, when you're having surgery, we have to give direct acting adrenergic agonists, isoprotonerinol being the most common, or sometimes epinephrine, uh, to directly increase the heart rate because the body won't be able to do it because that nerve is cut. Uh, Fire med chick, good to see you. In the ambulance, we have patients spare down to try and break SVT before we use adenosine for exactly that reason. I love it. I love it. Uh, what are vagal nerve fibers? Vagal nerve fibers are what we call the nerves, the individual little axons that are going ultimately from the spinal cord, the, actually say the brainstem, the very top, um, cranial nerve 10, <clears throat> going down. It's not just one solid nerve. It's multiple, multiple little nerves within little bundles. And those are the fibers that we refer to, Heidi. Great question. Uh, how do I feel about EMDR to help with healing from PTSD? Uh, Christy, I'm not an expert in EMDR from the therapist that I've spoken with. They've had fantastic results. I don't personally provide uh, EMDR, so I can't comment on uh, my experience with it. But I'm sure in the hands of the right provider with the right <clears throat> setting around that, it can be very powerful. Great question. Uh, gallbladder removal, Tony Ann. Gallbladder removals are fortunately very common, very safe for the routine elective cholecystectomy, usually and then laparoscopically, which by the way, because we're talking about the vagus nerve, <clears throat> they inflate the belly with a lot of carbon dioxide and that inflates your belly. Then they put cameras in and they cut out the gallbladder and take it out of the hole. That's how the vast majority of cholecystectomies or gallbladder removals are done. What I want to mention though, is that when you're under anesthesia for that and they blow up your belly, that actually causes a very strong vagal nerve response because of how it's pushing on the diaphragm, that gas that they're inflating up to like 25, uh, I think they use centimeters of water for their unit, but you're inflating your belly, your, your heart rate actually goes down. You're asleep, you don't know what's happening, but we sometimes actually give uh, medications ahead of time to artificially raise the heart rate so that when the, we call it pneumoperitoneum, when we blow up the belly, we prevent a massive heart rate drop. So very interesting that you mentioned that because it's a very, very um, powerful reflex that we need to compensate for. Otherwise, you might have a bradycardic cardiac arrest. These things can happen with sudden increases in pressure. Uh, very different than like a pregnancy because you got, you know, over nine months, you have intra abdominal pressure increasing. If you do it suddenly with the pneumoperitoneum, uh, you can have very rapid and dramatic vagal tone increases that will tank your heart rate. Uh, any users here been in combat and or served as a combat medic? Christy, I would love to know the answer to that question as well. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excellent. We're caught up on questions. The last thing I want to mention here that I had prepared because we're talking about mindfulness and habit loops and breathing in the vagus nerve is that, like I said at the beginning, the most powerful thing in medication is having a mindfulness view of yourself and what you surround yourself with. 
Because when you're mindful, you can pick up habit loops in the act of them happening. And you can't change habit loops if you're not even aware that they're happening. And habit loops, remember, they underlie pretty much everything. Not only just like dietary choices, which can cause everything from heart disease to cancer, physical activity, but maybe more importantly, our moods, depressive habit loops that kick in, habit loops that underlie, that underlie pain intensity, habit loops behind anxiety, even hyperarousal from PTSD coming up. I'm not saying it's anyone's fault. It's not the patient's fault. It, no one, that's not, that's not at all what we're getting at. It's that these are habit loops that have been learned over time, often from childhood, from adverse childhood experiences, young adulthood, or even in our adult lives. Anything that we see in repeated patterns, our body habituates to. It's not just humans, dogs, animals, bugs, everything in nature appears to have a habituation to the things that happen regularly. So when we keep doing habit loops, we are enforcing those effects on our brain, mind, body, et cetera. And you can't catch them. It's very difficult to realize that you're in them unless a therapist is working with you or if you've had maybe a psychedelic experience where you're now able to look at your habit loops from a different perspective to give you a glimpse of what life could be like without that habit loop, recognizing that there are other alternatives to those loops that have been ingrained over days, months, and years. It happens not only with a psychedelic experience, um, like in my ketamine clinic before surgery. I had a patient last week who's been trying to cut smoking forever. And I did some serious clinical hypnosis with them as we were falling asleep in, that, in those vulnerable moments. I have to follow up with them to see how well it worked. You know, everyone's different. It doesn't always work. But when it does, remember, there are no medications that we have in the West that can cold turkey help someone quit smoking, which is the most powerful thing you can do for your health, hands down. All from the power of the mind and body and tapping into that, in that case, with clinical hypnosis as they're falling asleep with the mask on their face in that vulnerable, potentially frightening moment. Once again, compassion, care, thoughtfulness, and mindfulness can help patients accomplish these incredible things for which we have no medications. Um, all right, Chris D. Yeah, Chris, I wanted to have you on as a guest, but I didn't, I, I, when I messaged you earlier on the Discord, didn't get through, but certainly I'd love to have you on as a guest. I really want to try out YouTube's new feature because that's, uh, so many people will benefit from hearing your story, Chris, and I'm sure others. That being said, we talked about a lot of, uh, covered a lot of ground. Teresa's asking about Discord. Yes, the Discord link is in uh, the description in YouTube. You should definitely check it out because I can I announce ahead of time, kind of the times when we're planning on going live so you can get your questions answered. I think we've got everyone's questions in here and I hope everyone appreciates that window of mindfulness that we talked about. What things can help us become more mindful? The list is very long. Psychedelics are one, only one, but spiritual practices, in some cases, religion for the right patient. But breathing is something that we all have to do. So ask yourself, the next time you're recognizing how you're breathing, can you try to recognize how you're breathing before maybe the rapid shallowness has led to anxiety? Can you pick it up a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, and with enough practice, with making a new habit loop for yourself to just recognize how your breathing is going, you can get in the driver's seat, get back in control of your health. Now, I'm not, I'm not advertising a watch here, and Garmin doesn't pay me, but a lot of these new watches certainly have little heart rate variability detectors that can vibrate your phone, uh, vibrate your, your uh, watch as a little bit of a heads up that, hey, you're breathing in a rapid, shallow way. We can tell because your heart rate variability is sinking. Are you stressed? I actually, when I was on my ICU rotation in residency at Harvard, I programmed a this is before we had these you know, watches that did this. I programmed my own little thing on my watch at the time that would like, <laughs> um, <laughs> in all seriousness, <laughs> I had it flash on the watch face, life is short, when it detected that my heart rate variability was dropping. And I remember this, and I'm laughing about it now, not because life is short in, in a, you know, life is precious, of course. And it is short and precious and valuable. But I remember my senior resident at the time was like, why is your watch saying life is short? 
<laughs> because when I would give my presentations and routes, I would get very nervous and anxious. When I was this is like a while ago, I was I would get very anxious, and you, my heart rate could totally tell. People around me couldn't tell because I would hold my composure. But through what I programmed on my watch, my watch knew, and it would buzz, buzz, buzz to the point where the um, senior resident was like, "Are you okay?" <laughs> so um, it's not. <sighs> Uh, and I see people laughing here in the comments. So we all struggle with anxieties, with uncertainties, with lack of curiosity when we're detached, when we're not mindful of the situation. We all suffer from uh, feeling like we're not in control. But we can overcome these with the right mindsets. And you know what? No medications can really help with this, with the rare exception of psychedelics in the right setting, which is why the power of spiritual growth and psychedelics are just so powerful inside and outside the operating room. So that's karma. They're ringing the bell. She's got to go potty. So, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, hopefully this week, karma, I'll be there in a second. Yeah. She's like, why aren't you letting me out, daddy? All right. Uh, I'm going to go let her out. We'll be on again before the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and so this one last question, because Ursuline, good to see you, is asking, why did it take 10 minutes to wake up from surgery? My doctor mentioned to me, so it makes me think it is unusual. Is that true? Ursuline, 10 minutes may be perfectly appropriate. Depends on the type of surgery you had. You can't see karma, but she's down here now, trying to get more of my attention. Depends on the surgery you had, the type of anesthesia you had. Do you have red hair? Uh, do you drink alcohol? Do you use other drugs? Or, you know, hopefully not. But all these things go in to determining how long it takes to wake up from anesthesia. So it's not like there's ever right or wrong or good or bad, but it depends on you as an individual. I can't answer why. But 10 minutes um, for surgeries under two hours, usually patients are waking up within a minute. If they're longer than two, three hours, then things um, can certainly be longer. Great question. For brain surgeries, spine surgeries, that time might be even longer. So it depends on many factors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, wish you guys a good rest of the weekend. And I hope everyone has a, a good Thanksgiving if I don't see you on live again before then. Until then, you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. And if you have learned something, do share with, your, with others and hit that like button. It does help me do this more often. Take care, everyone. All right, Karma, let's do it. Hey, Pika, Kirby, we'll, we'll see you. We'll, <laughs> we'll see you next time. Sophia, you bet. Tony Ann, good luck tomorrow. All right, Karma, let's go. Let's do it. Oh, good girl, Carmen. Good girl. Oh, I didn't hit stop yet. Whoops. <laughs> I thought it was off. <laughs>